Okay, everyone, this is Jason Augustus Newcomb. We are inside the Magic Circle once again. And today I am super excited to be talking to Robert M. Place. He is an author and the creator of uh, quite a number of very beautiful um, tarot decks. The one that I'm most familiar with is the Alchemical Tarot Restored, um, which is an amazing deck. I've got a copy myself. And Robert, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. So, so uh, go ahead. You know, so, so I was reading your. Uh, you know the the literature you sent me about uh, so so basically the magic circle you're more you're mostly interested in magic right well i'm interested in anything to do with the esoteric and the and the, um you know from from reading your book it seems like there's a there's a, a jungian perspective that's that's um pretty prevalent in in the way that you approach oh, yeah. things and and it's i like to, i like to hear that voice too because more and more we're hearing um very sort of um I would almost call them religious occultists who who look at who look at um, uh, magical ritual in a very different way than than um, a lot of the recent uh, generations of occultists. They're very sort of literalist and and want to follow the grimoires exactly to the letter or whatever book they're working. So I, I enjoy talking to someone who has more of a consciousness focus on it and more of a psychological focus. Oh, it's just okay. sort of a palate cleanse <laughs> from that every once in a while. So. Um, I, I I don't know which opinion is right. I just I just like to hear them all. So, but but I'm but I'm I'm mostly interested in just talking to you because I love your tarot and uh, you know I I I I noticed that you're that you've been since since I first discovered your tarot you have put out several more decks. So I want to talk about you know what what your creative process is and what and what got you started along those lines. You know, actually, but, more than more than several, I'd say quite a bit of decks. How many? How many have you done? I, 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 it's hard to count because then there's variations on the decks, and not all of them. See, some of the decks I've done are oracle decks. Also, they're not necessarily tarot decks. And then also there's variations, like like with the the tarot of the sevenfold mystery. I first did an edition, the uh, annotated edition, which was a limited edition uh, of just the trumps with uh, annotations. And then there was I actually had big prints of that made and that was uh, featured in my sh uh, you know the uh, exhibition i put on at the uh, los angeles craft and folk art museum so you know where i, I had those and then in context with historic decks and and uh, more in many contemporary decks so uh you know that's so, a great exhibition i wish i could have also seen also as each edition of the alchemical throw a new deck or you know <laughs> i mean you know because there's six different editions and then sure. uh, you know, and then and then there's all you know different decks that have been published by other uh, publishing companies, and now that I publish them myself also. And then there's decks that I don't really uh, do a mass printing; I, they're just art editions, like so, like the, the the woodcut deck that's a copy of the one from uh, the historic one from Ferrara. That it, even the Metropolitan Museum has a copy of that. Well, I will uh, I, I will go. I, I would like to hear more about each of, of the decks that you've created, but l let's go back to the beginning. Um, what what got you interested in in doing tarot art? It's a it's a it's a challenging. I mean, I, as you know, I'm doing a, a tarot project yeah, myself. Yeah, I, right I like your deck too. So <laughs> it, it's it's a challenging process to be creating that much art all in one. Um, well, actually, that that's interesting because the thing is, uh, you know, I've see I've always been an artist. Like, I mean, I was, you know, I knew I was an artist since I could say the word. You know, as a little kid, because mm -hmm. I just drew all the time. And, and, you know, people ask you, what are you going to be when you grow up? And say, oh, an artist. And, uh, you know, like I, when I, like I could draw realistically at a very early age. I mean, my father was amazed. Like, you know, he'd be looking at me like, wow, this kid could draw better than I can. And he's like this little kid, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I, so I've got a, I've got a kid who's like that, actually. She, yeah. She's very talented <laughs> at, at representing things. So, so uh, you know, like I used, to, I used to have a pad with me and, and pencil and every, and every time my parents would visit somebody, I'd draw their little ceramic things around the house or like objects around their <laughs> <Cool>. house. And, <laughs> and you were, you were giving yourself an art class just in, in, in life. You just Yeah, I mean, I just do all the time, you know, like I was always drawing. And um, so, so but, you know, I mean, and I remember, you know, when I saw on TV, when they, when they, you know, you see a show and they show somebody going to an art museum, I said, wow, there's art museums, you know, <laughs> <laughs> take me there. You know? <laughs> so I forced my parents to take me to the Met, you know, because, you know, we lived in New Jersey, so okay. not that far from New York City. So, so anyway, so the thing is, by the uh, time I got to college, I was studying, uh, I was studying to be, uh, I was studying art education, to be an art teacher. And, um, but I, I, I was always interested in, in, um, 
I mean, you know, when I, I guess when I, I was in, even when I was in high school, when I first discovered the surrealist, I would said, wow, this is, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. So when I was in college, I was kept reading more and more books on the occult and, uh, you know, buying books. And there, there was, a, there was this uh, occult bookshop in Hackensack, New Jersey, that I don't think is there anymore. Like, the, you know, occult bookshops used to be really weird, yeah. Not, you know, more so than now even. <laughs> They, they were like because it wasn't like a mainstream it wasn't like you could go to the regular bookstore and buy occult books like you could now you can go to barnes and noble and buy all kinds of stuff right but the thing is or just go to amazon but you know they had to go to these little out of the way places like with these weird people who had, had occult bookshops and then it was, so i went this one in, in hack and seconds to get books and then and then i saw that then there was this thing online where you could get you know, could order some books and i got this book uh the picture history of uh picture museum of occult uh, and alchemy and you know some, i forgot the whole title but it's, but it's a reprint of this uh french edition from early in the 20th century uh, and so i so i kept studying these things and then my, my girlfriend was in into the tarot and and, and she was you know of course she's using the wade smith cards this is back in the, in the late 1960s so uh you know i was looking at the cards and i started getting interested in, in them so i would go in the library and look for books and i found uh, books in the in the school library where they had uh, they showed antique decks you know the french decks so just seeing that there was history behind this so i said well these are really interesting i like these antique ones better so i, I said well i'm going to make my own tarot deck so i got a piece of cardboard and i cut out the card size and i started copying the the uh the marseille images i got about four cards done and i said this is a lot of work you know i don't think i, yeah. can do <laughs> I mean this is like a huge amount of work so <laughs> So that was about it, you know, for back then, right? Okay, so then years jump ahead, <laughs> and and meantime, I I had I was teaching I had been teaching art in, in a grammar school, and then I quit and I started uh, I started doing um, making jewelry, and I was doing craft shows and things like that, but and and I was um, living in New Jersey um, in a town near the Delaware River on the on the western side of New Jersey, and I, and I I had this. Uh, I had a dream one night. I thought it was 19, I didn't think it was 1982. And I had this dream because, you know, I was doing, see, I was doing craft shows and the dream was about, uh, I saw another person who I knew from, from the craft show. So it was, uh, and, I, and I, I was following her down the street and following her into the house. And that was about a whole other situation. It was just a regular dream, you know, talking about a situation that was developing. Uh, but when I walked into the house, I was in the living room I remember, it was like a brick house. We went up the stairs and, and there was a living room and there was a, a table with a telephone on it, like a telephone table. You know, men used to have those. And uh, sure. Yeah. You know, and, and they had like a you know black telephone with a handle on top, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it rang. And when it rang, it rang, it woke me into this lucidity because it was like, it's like, you know, it used to be like, like a phone call would interrupt you during the day because you had to go answer it. I didn't have it. You know, you didn't have an answer machine back then. Right. Not everybody did. So you would answer the phone. So it was sort of like, wow, somebody's calling me in a dream. I don't know if you could interrupt the dream. It, 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 I mean, it was like, it was weird because I realized right away the phone was a message coming from outside the dream. That's interesting. So I picked up the phone and uh, I, the, uh, the, the uh, operator got on, the dream operator. She said you had a person to person call for Robert Place uh, from England and would I accept it? So I said, oh yeah, okay, I'll accept it. And then she put on this woman who was a secretary for a dream law firm. And uh, she told me I had inheritance coming and I had to agree to accept the inheritance. And it was coming from my ancestor in England. And, and, uh, and, she's, and she said it has, a, basically she told me that it's a very powerful tool and I had to agree to it because I had to accept this power, but also my ancestor had, ancestor had misused it in some ways. So there was such that I had to take on. Interesting. And I didn't even think about that, you know, it was sort of like, what a karmic, you know, I mean, it seems like that should have made you like worried, right? Right. But I, you know, in the middle of June, I was all excited, like, oh yeah, I want this inheritance. So I said, oh sure, send it to me. So how will I know? And she said, well, you know, when you see it, it comes in a box from England, it's called the key. So uh, I woke up in the morning, like it was, it was so vivid. I woke up and I expected the box to be at the foot of the bed. I mean, that's how vivid this dream was, right? And my wife's, you know, Roseanne's looking at me and I, and I had explained about the dream and she said, well, that's really exciting. So uh, we'll see what happens. So I was. Uh, I just wanna, can, I, can I pause for a second here? So yeah, you're, sure. 
are, have, do you have a lot of dreams where things actually come true for them or was your wife just playing along with you? Like, what, what is the, <laughs> well, okay. Well, okay. That's actually a fair question. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, well, my wife's obviously used to me. Right. But the thing is, um, you know, I, I, my, my, I always tell people my main form of divination is dream divination. I always always pay attention to my dreams, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and I noticed in dreams, uh, often, uh, you know, like they actually do, like in dreams, they actually do foretell the future sometimes. Like, you know, people who analyze dreams, like I have a friend who's a psychologist and, and all his dreams are always about his childhood and about the, you know, you know like working on the, his uh, neurosis from his childhood and like going over living in Patterson and, uh, uh, you know, dealing with his parents and, you know, and, there are, and because he's a psychologist, that's what he expects his dreams to be. <laughs> so they actually <laughs> do what he expects them to do, right? Where my dreams are like, you know, hardly ever, I mean, sometimes that happens, but the thing is, I, they're all over the place. And sometimes, you know, I had dreams that told me how to fix the computer or, uh, uh, or they tell me things are going to happen six months from now. <laughs> so, you know, because I pay attention to dreams in a different way, I let them do whatever they want. Okay, so, so so yes, I did pay attention to my dreams regularly, but they didn't always, they weren't always, this is probably the most vivid, vivid dream I ever had in my life. Well, and let's continue the story. Okay. <laughs> so within a few days, I'm sitting at the table in uh, in my kitchen, and there's a, the door, the back door to the house is right in the kitchen to off to my left. Uh, and my friend Scott came over. Uh, and, and a friend of his had just mailed him the Wade Smith cards. And so he wanted to show them to me. So he comes, he comes in, he opens it because he's a good friend. He just opens the door and comes in. And as he comes in, my head turns involuntarily and my eyes focus on the, on the deck in his hands. And, 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 and it's just like with the, uh, with the dream, uh, you know, the secretary told me that I know it when I see it. And it's sort of like my head just focused and it's like, Oh, that's it. That's the inheritance. Right. Cause it's like, uh, you know, it's it, it was originally made in England. It comes in a box. It's it, it's it, it, and the trumps are called keys. You know, by the occultists and and, and you hadn't that, thought about the tarot much since the time that that you were playing. Not, not, with it. I mean, not, you know, it just generally and amongst other things, I was very interested in the symbolic art and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like I I had gotten more and more. In fact, I had gotten more and more enamored with the symbolist painters and the pre-Raphaelites. Hmm. So, um, the, you know, so, so anyway, we, we started looking at the cards and then I told Scott about the dream and he said, you know, and he seemed really excited about it. And I said, gee, well, I guess I have to get this deck, you know, cause uh, I mean, th that's, that's my inheritance. So, so uh, you know, so later Scott w w went off with his deck and I figured I have to go buy a deck, but it wasn't like you could just go buy a deck because they didn't have them in bookstores. Mm -hmm. Not like now. A, a shop. I couldn't go online and buy it, you know, because it's in 1982. So, uh, like within a few days, I had another friend, uh, uh, you know, who, who uh, Ed, who was an astrologer, and he's and he's very intuitive. So he came he came over. To, he used to come to visit too. Like it just sort of, you know, the friends used to just pop in, right? And uh, so he came over and he and he was holding the Marseille deck, the Tower of Marseille, and he said, I, you know. I have this deck, I never use it. And I have this really strong feeling that you're supposed to have it. So he gave me the Tarot of Marseille. And this is like within like four days after the dream, right? So, so, so I started working with the Tarot of Marseille and then I said, but I should get the Wade Smith also. So I made a point that I went into Manhattan and driving to Manhattan. I went, I went into Times Square in Manhattan, went to a bookstore that had tarot decks. And they were behind the counter. And I said, you know, uh, I want one of those uh, tarot decks, right? And he goes, you mean the tarot? You know, like, he's like, you don't you know how to say it? Being, you know? being pretentious with you? Yeah, right. So I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want the tarot. So, so he gave me the Wade Smith deck. I bought it. I went home. And, um, and I, you know, so I had the Marseille deck and, the, and the, uh, you know, the tarot Marseille. And I remembered, okay, my girlfriend used to do the, the Celtic cross spread. Mm -hmm. So I started working doing the Celtic cross spread, and I said, "Well, gee, maybe I should get some books about this and start reading more about it." <laughs> so I got a, but you know, I I had always been like I was telling you, I was always in I'm not only an artist, but like an art historian. I've been you know, sure. avid reader of all this information. So so I started reading some of these tarot books I could get, and none of them made any sense because they were all to you know saying like the cards came from ancient Egypt and. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or like a Fez Morocco. Or, I mean, none, none of this made any sense because it was like, I, from my art history uh, knowledge, I knew it was impossible what they were saying. So, uh, you know, I started trying to figure out what was real about this. And, and I noticed all these symbols, like especially in the in the Wade Smith deck, I noticed all these alchemical symbols and, and, and esoteric symbols. So, and I started reading more books on like uh, alchemy and Gnosticism and, and mysticism and like and trying to and find the symbols that were in the deck that had that weren't being talked about in most of the tarot books. And then and, and then it got more. I got more and more. Um, it, it got more and more intense. You know, well, I, I I see behind you that it looks like you have maybe. 30 to 40 what look like tarot boxes behind you of various different oh, this, yeah, that's that's you know some of my tarot decks <laughs> <laughs> it's the ones i haven't even looked at lately the ones i look at more like well see also even like i, I like to have i like antique decks i like, see this one here this is this is a, a minchiati card that's from uh you know 18 um can you see it okay yeah, yeah. It looks like it's got a a, a baboon oh, and four four yeah, faces. Yeah, like an ape looking at a mirror, which is a symbol of vanity. Mm -hmm. Which I really like. See, I, I really like the Minkiati. I'm getting more and more involved in it. And it's interesting on the pip cards of the Minkiati, and it's from 1810. You can see there's already image, meaningful sure. imagery on the pip yeah. card. So, so let's take a moment and talk about the history of the tarot for a second um, as well, because I know that that is one of the areas that you do know a lot about. And I, I actually am pretty up on it myself, but I have the feeling that some of my viewers are still operating in a world where maybe the tarot is from ancient Egypt. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about that. I mean, I know the, the current thinking is more um, that, that, it, that it's related, it, it, it is related to Middle Eastern culture to a certain extent, um, right? The Persian empire. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, see, well, you yeah, to sort out the, you know, the thing is like, um, I, this is joke I used to tell my, uh, students like you know where uh this, this guy goes into the uh, the bar and he sees he, he sees his friend there who's really really drunk and his friend walks out first so then he comes out to see how he's doing and he sees his friend like on his hands and knees under the street lamp and he goes what are you doing he says, i'm looking for my car keys he says oh yeah you need your car keys to get home right and you think about the guy's gonna drive drunk like this yeah but <laughs> so but he says he, so he's looking for his car keys under the the street lamp and he goes oh that's that's good did you drop them there he goes no i dropped them over there but there's no light there <laughs> that's sort of like how history is you know <laughs> that was a very woody allen moment there um <laughs> so, so so, so you mean you, you mean to say that there's a, because there's well, there's, there's obscurity, people just focus on the areas where you can see. Yeah, no, it's like everybody's always talking about ancient Greece and everything started in ancient Greece because the ancient Greece wrote a lot. Right. And, and so the only thing you can study if you're going to read what they wrote is the ancient Greek thing. So of course it's you know you have this uh, you know uh, Greek centered view of of history you know mm -hmm. and 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 there's huge amounts of history that never were written about. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I mean, technically, maybe they're maybe they're not even history because the, you know, history means it's written, right? Right. So, and and maybe there maybe there's things written that we've never seen because I mean, we just don't have access to. Yeah, and a, and a lot. Well, see, a lot of books disappeared too. You, you yeah. see, thing like like papyrus and things like that. Like most of the papyrus we have is is preserved in Egypt because the climate's so dry and mm -hmm. hot and dry, you know. But for the most part, it deteriorated. And so, and, and most, and most of the ancient books are written on papyrus or then, you know, on parchment and, and, they, and they just disappeared. So the only reason we have ancient books for the most part is because they were, they were considered valuable and copied over and over and over again, you know, like the medieval monks would do. Right. So, so, and as if they didn't, so, if, so there would be all kinds of literature that like, you know, we could have been reading about, but then it just disappeared and then, and nobody thought it was worthwhile to copy. Yeah. You know, it's crazy I mean, to think about. Yeah, well, the same thing is, you know, same things happened more recently with movies and stuff where the, the early movies all started falling apart and unless they right. made new copies, then that's it, gone, you know. Yeah, well, luckily that, that, that there has been a, a large scale effort to, to restore those. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff has been lost. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, to get into history. Okay, so, <laughs> so I was saying it's complicated, right? Right. Okay, okay, so here, here's the thing. Car Cards are made out of paper, so the thing is, um, also don't last that long, right? 
Yeah, well, pa well, paper. Yeah, but you know, if you want to study cards, you have to find out who made paper because mm -hmm. obviously the first people to make cards were the Chinese because they made paper. I mean, that's it's simple. The right. first people to have paper money, the first people to have toilet paper, the first people to have newspapers. You know, <laughs> you know, anything you think about made out of paper, the Chinese had it first because they invented paper, and and they weren't that and they weren't that keen on like showing everybody else how to do that. I mean, they're right. sort of like we have paper. If, you know, screw you. You know, we don't have to show you. So, uh, but it sort of leaked out, and especially with the Mongols, because the Mongol. See, I mean, we we can see that there were paper books in Baghdad, uh, like you know, around uh, like the Middle Ages. You know, so like obviously they have learned paper from the Chinese somehow, and there's like stories about how they captured. There was a battle with the Chinese, and they captured some of the Chinese soldiers, and the soldiers said, "Look, we'll teach you how to make paper if you set us free." And I said, "Okay." You know, I mean, there's, you know, there's all these tidbits of stories about paper spreading out. But the main reason paper spread out is because the Genghis Khan conquered this huge empire from that from Mongolia all the way to Europe. Like it included Russia and, and uh, you know, uh, Hungary and Poland and all these places. And as, along with Persia and, you know, uh, parts of India. I mean, it was like huge, you know, all the way to the shores of, uh, of Egypt. And. Uh, and then his 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 sons and his grandsons split it up, and I, th I think he had like I think it was like four grandsons, so it split it up into four separate empires that all stayed together, mm -hmm. uh, like and created. They basically created modern uh, modern commerce. So uh, so the way so the way modern commerce worked is that goods from all the way, so even China joined in. It was Kublai Khan was the was the uh, the grandson who uh, who was still in control of Mongolia, but the Chinese joined in with him, so he actually controlled China, and Mongolia, and uh, and and of course with that he had all the inventions of paper and all these things. So he they had this really cool thing called paper money, which would, which would use a currency all through the empires, so they could spread goods back and forth because otherwise they have to carry big bags of gold. So. Yeah. That makes sense. So that so that brought paper all the way to Europe. You see, like so, everybody started finding out that there was this thing called paper that was really cool. Because and the thing, is, paper is like, you know, did you ever? You know, you go to you go to the like go to the museum, like go to the cloisters, and you see an illuminated manuscript, right? You know, yeah. and you see this this big book and with parchment pages, and you know maybe there's eighty pages in the book, and they're all like made out of parchment. You realize that those are the skins of like small animals, sure. like calves, you know. <laughs> So you had to like slaughter like 80 calves to make a book. in order to have a few pieces of paper, yeah. Which yeah, is why know, they used them over and over again, right? They just yeah, scrape yeah, off like, whatever. So I mean, you know, they're, that's why they're so, one of the reasons besides then they would spend, you know, years hand littering them and doing mm -hmm. illuminated manuscript, putting gold on it and you know, and all these things to make a, a book. You know, that's why they're so expensive. A book costs the same amount as a farm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so it wasn't probably like took, had a lot of it took as much or more book. work than a farm would take for a year just to make the book, right? Yeah, right. So, and then, and also it didn't lend itself to cards because it crinkles. And that's why you see on the, on the books, they have these big heavy wooden covers and then they put mm -hmm. gold things and enamel and, and then they have a latch that latch it. I mean, basically what they're doing, they're pressing the pages flat so they don't crinkle okay. and keep it as in book form, right? Okay. So they're obviously not going to work as cards, right? And then parchment, you know, like parchment, I mean, I mean, a, a papyrus, papyrus is where we get the word paper, but papyrus like sort of frays at the edges and it doesn't lend itself to cards. I mean, sure. you can make it stiff and put, you know, sizing on it or something and make it, they, you end up basically with a little board like thing. But, uh, but generally they put them in scrolls, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you could just keep going on and on and on with it. You don't have to have so many paper edges. And, you know, and see, like, papyrus was the main thing used in the ancient world. But the thing is, uh, in, in Alexandria, they had, like the the library in Alexandria was so um, jealous of like having all the information there. Like the, like if a ship came into the port in Alexandria, they had to uh, give give over all their all their uh, all the books they had, all the scrolls they had to be copied, and then they give them back to them. Wow. And, and so they had scribes working all the time copying books, and they were trying to have every book in the world in the library. And so they ha it was illegal for them to sell papyrus outside of Egypt because they needed it all. Mm. See? Because it's just it's just this plant, you know, and then it's just a certain reed that makes the makes the papyrus. So now with paper, they 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 ground up mulberry bark and cloth and different things that were more prevalent, and they made the sheet that had sharp edges, and also you could it would accept a wood block print really well. So you could like you know Chinese started developing printing right away. Right. Okay, so that made the whole thing economical. 
and it, and you know it wasn't until like well like uh you know the the, the uh, uh four, 1400s when you know in in Europe when they started having more and more paper books you know like because they had paper from like I don't know I, I guess it was first made in Spain in like around in like the 1200s but it was obviously introduced by the uh, Arabic culture you know in Spain and then but it, they, they didn't really get going until like until they had movable type like in, in uh, 1450 you know with the with movable type that's when uh uh you start seeing like you know between 1450 and 1500 they printed more books than in the whole middle ages wow yeah i mean you know, well, it so, makes so, sense since they, since they had to write you have to realize that's an explosion yeah right so well they, they were already print see the thing is they were already working with paper and printing but they would have to carve the whole page as one thing right Lettering. Movable type changed everything. Yeah, and then when you move type, then you can make the pages go really fast, right? So that made it like, and then also it works really well with woodblock prints. So so then there was this big need for artists to make woodblock prints that fit in. And then of course they wanted the artists to do other things because all the publishers were, uh, uh, you know, like they want to make money, right? So they said, well, make, what can we make to sell to people who can't read? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I know we'll make cards, you know, so, so, and they're like, this is really cool thing we learned from the Arabs, this, you know, th th these playing cards, you know, they get back to the, you know, Genghis Khan, not only spread paper, but they started playing splitting card games. So then the Arabs, you know, the, the, we had card games in India and then, and then in Persia and like in Egypt and all these places. They, and then the Mumluk game, which was uh, the rulers of Egypt and the Middle East, they spread that on to, to, uh, to, to Spain and Sicily, and that's how the Europeans learned about cards. And that's the that's the first sort of prototypical playing card game with four suits, and and it, it yeah, and the it, four suits, the Mumluk deck, the four suits are are, uh, are coins, cups, scimitars, which of course are swords, and then polo sticks. Mm -hmm. And then and thing is, when of course when it came to Spain, they copied it, but they, they but they didn't know what a polo stick was because they didn't play polo, so they just made it a stick, right, <laughs> or a club, right. <laughs> I mean, on the, Spanish, on the Spanish decks today, I mean, they still use that same those same four suits in the Spanish decks. In any Spanish culture, all through Latin America, they all use those same four suits instead of what you know the, the suits we think of more um, you know that are more obvious in the four suit decks around the world are the French suits, which are the you know the hearts and clubs and things. So, and, and, and this is an important moment though because uh, playing cards preceded; they were before tarot cards. They they yeah, they yeah Well, the tarot is a particular type of card game. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so cards and paper make it from China to the Middle East and finally get to Europe. So this is, it's like around 1300s when cards start being made in Europe, but they're not tarot decks. They're four suit decks and they look just like the minor suits in the tarot because they're the same suit symbols. Right. Right. Also on the, on the Islamic decks, they didn't, uh, they, the Mumluk seem to have a prohibition about drawing people like, you know, more strict iconoclast. So, uh, so they, you know, on on the like they like their decks had ten pip cards and then three royal cards that were all male. There was like the vizier, his lieutenant, and second lieutenant. But they would just have decorative patterns and they'd write the words on the cards, right? Right, because way. you aren't allowed to represent people because that might be worshiping. Yeah, yeah. but that isn't universal. I mean, because the Persian cards had people on them, so you know, it wasn't universal to Islamic culture. But a lot of Islamics were strict that way. So. Uh, there's even arguments that there was some other reason they did it, but I don't buy it. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, yeah. okay. There... So, so in Spain and you know in Italy, of course, they started with they interpret the vizier as the king, and then and then uh, and 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 then there would be the knight and his squire or the or a page, which you know what we call a page, but the page is this misnomer. It'd be it would be either squire or a knave. A knave's mm -hmm. a servant. See, a page technically is a young man. Who's who's uh, uh, put under the tutorship uh, tutorage of a, a noble woman, so that he can be refined to become more of a gentleman, and then when he reaches a certain age, he becomes a squire, and then he's the apprentice to the knight. So the so the the so if if the the third card is the apprentice to the knight, then it's a squire, not a page. Another but interesting just, 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 yeah, just but, a side digression for a second. Is there any evidence of there being a a, a female in that lower in that lower oh, yeah, cast yeah. as well? What? Yeah, because because it, it, mostly there were knaves. They're just supposed to be servants. But then, well, well, you know, um, in the uh, uh, traditionally in the minkiati, the the in the in the suit of uh, cups and coins, the the knaves female. Okay. Even the Minkiati decks make today, 
or, or, just, or like and for, or for the anyone... Cari Cariel Visconti deck, which is the old one of the oldest. Yeah. yeah. Distance. Okay, so there's there's a, a king, a queen, a, a knight, and, a, and his lady, the the knave and his woman. You know, so there's a male and female knave, a male and female knight. You know, the reason the reason that I'm asking this question for anyone who's watching this is that in certain occult traditions, there's there's a a king and a queen, a, a prince and a princess, or a, you know, or a um, a, a la you know, they they well, they, well, they actually keep all it. my deck, almost all my decks are like that. I I have you know the the king and queen, and then the knight and the lady. Okay, yeah, that's and, I mean that makes that makes sense just for keeping things balanced, but um, it it it's 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 rather ambiguous throughout the history of of uh, playing cards what is being done there, right? And how many decks have the fourth? Um, the fourth court card where does that come from and, and how does that work well here's the well the thing is like i told you the original decks like even the spanish decks today have all male court cards mm -hmm. it's just a king a knight and a, and a knave right okay so uh and there's lots of decks in italy like that too but what some decks started having a, a queen you see in the 1300s this is the, this is the like the 1200 1300s the age of chivalry when the when like the idea of femininity becomes more important so one of the things the europeans started adding to things is this idea of the importance of women mm. in fact in fact you know a lot of people uh you I mean it's, it's hard to get around this but like like the word uh she was added to the english language a thousand years ago what was it previously how, how would you represent a woman I, I think I think that it's confusing to me. I've been trying to figure that out, <laughs> but I think I think it's I think that the word he was just used for either male or female. Mm. Didn't distinguish or or you know because some people say oh so what was that him and it you know, but um, <laughs> but I think it's really just he just just, just meant either. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so it seemed like but where you, now you had a separate word for male and female like he and she. So. Uh, but this is the age when, uh, like, like the cult of uh, the Virgin Mary was brought over from Greece into Western Europe, and then, and then you start seeing that taking on real importance. And it's the age of chivalry, when, when, and of course the rules of chivalry: the knight is supposed to pledge himself to a woman like of higher rank. And then it's also the troubadour songs where there's like this, you know, it's, it's all these songs, this beautiful, unattainable woman that represents the highest ideals. So we're starting to see this appreciation for femininity and feminine qualities. In Europe, in European culture, starting like in the 12 and 1300s. Okay, so so when the, like for instance, the game of chess came from India and it was called Shataranga, which meant four kings. Mm -hmm. So when, by the time it gets to Europe, they changed it instead of two, four armies, they changed it to two armies and they changed one of the kings to a queen. See, and now the queen's the most powerful piece on the on the board, really. Mm -hmm. Even though the the, the object game is to capture the king, but the most powerful player is the, right. the queen. The most okay. able. Okay, similarly with the with the card decks, they started adding queens. And see, especially in German decks, you know, like uh, early German and, and uh, Flemish decks. But now it's interesting because today the the, the tr traditional German deck doesn't have a queen. It it's 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 got uh, the king and then the uh, the upper knave and the lower knave. Hmm. So, excuse me. So you need something? No. Okay, my wife just came in. <laughs> So, so at, at what point does do these card games then start becoming the tarot games? Like, and 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 okay, so like, and so that's see, that's hard to explain too, because see, the thing is, most people when they think about the tarot, they think okay, they must have been you know made by some magician or something or cabalist and been fully formed from the beginning. But really, when you look at the early decks, like there's an evolution going on. It doesn't just become the tarot. Like it's like, how do you define a tarot? So, so the broadest definition is that, okay, so we took the four suit deck and then we add this fifth suit of trump cards, right? And then, so if a deck has the four suits and trumps, then it's a tarot deck because originally they were, called, they were originally called triumphy decks. Right. Which is where, where the word trump comes from, which means, triumphy means a parade and which each character trumps the one that came before. So, um, the, so the earliest decks, now it's interesting, the earliest decks that we have seem to have trumps are made in Italy, in Northern Italy in uh, the early 1400s, maybe as early as like around 1412. Um, but, the, but the earliest one we know of is, is the one designed by Marziano for, uh, 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 for, the, for the, uh, you know, the, the Duke of, of Milan. Uh, 
Filippo Maria Visconti. So um, that, that now see see already I'm breaking the rule what I just said because because <laughs> the deck has four suits and then this fifth suit of Trumps. But the thing is, the four suits aren't the traditional four suits that we always think about, which you know the the, the uh, swords and, and stabs and and uh, coins and cups. The four suits are all birds. Hmm. Oh, and this is this is a deck that you're actually that you're working on a, a, a reproduction. Well, I did. On. I made a, re a reproduction uh, uh, of yeah. The, the deck doesn't exist, but it, we have his description of the deck. Mm -hmm. Description. So from his description, I recreated what the deck might have looked like. Uh, you know, and um, the, so the so the, the four birds are, are uh, there's uh, eagles, phoenixes, doves, and and turtle doves. Okay, so um, the, now the thing is. The, um, the the Trump see in the Trump cards. It's it's interesting because the Trump cards. There's 16 gods, so there's not you know 20. You know it's not like okay now there's we have the 22 Trump cards or mm -hmm. like 21 and a fool or whatever you know that the pattern we think of is normal. No, it's not normal at all. It's like it's got 16 gods like and it shows because it's the Renaissance and it's like this reclaiming of classical culture. So the so the gods are putting there and and and. And the text that went with it is it talked about them as uh, these ancient heroes. Like there was this theory that the gods were really these ancient heroes that became, you know, worship godlike. And so that's how they sort of made them acceptable to Christian culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so uh, that that story is still being floated today. Yeah, I mean, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Except not, you know, less and less people uh, care about being acceptable to Christian culture. Sure. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, the the uh, the sixteen gods, you know, you think, oh well, that's not the tarot at all. But then, if you look at them, at the sixteen gods that are there, and you say, and you look at the later tarot decks, you say, oh yeah, those gods. I mean, Cupid's in there, right? And mm -hmm. he actually he's actually number sixteen, and he always shows up in the tarot deck. He's always on the lovers card, right? Right. I mean, so Cupid's always in the tarot deck, and then uh, Hercules is in there, and go well, like well, the earliest. Uh, if we, if we look at uh, the, the uh, Visconti Sforza strength card, he shows Hercules on it. So, right. you know, that's not such a far fetch. And then, the, you know, uh, you know, we have Apollo and Diana. And then we look at some early, uh, like later decks and, and the sun and moon are Apollo and Diana. Mm -hmm. And then also, we, you know, the Swiss decks has, has Jupiter and Juno, which of course are right. in the deck. So, I mean, that's like those, and, and the, I think it was the Flemish decks has ba Bacchus in it and the Bacchus is in that deck. So those cards do keep popping up in other decks later. It's not like they're unrelated, but it's not that all the, the allegory you're thinking of, you know, and 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 then also there were there were certain decks that just had one Trump, the, the emperor. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, so, like the, so that was sort of like a wild card that was stuck in. That yeah, was, well, so, yeah, it's like, well, it's not a wild card. It's like it's a, uh, um, it's a card that trumps everything. Yeah, because there. see, the thing is, the fool was actually a wild card. And but the fool. The fool doesn't win the trick. See, like the game, the game of tarot is like the ancestor game of bridge, and so, um, but it has a natural trump suit. Like when you play bridge with the four suit deck, you have to assign one of the suits as the trumps. Mm -hmm. But this has a natural trump suit. So, if you're putting that, if you're putting down a card and you put down a trump card, it'll beat any other, you know, the minor suits. Right. But unless somebody has a higher trump card, right? But you can put the fool in, and you don't, and you don't lose anything or win anything. Get the fool back. <laughs> oh so it's just like a placeholder for for being able yeah, to they called it the forward. excuse so it's not at all like what you think of as a modern idea of a wild card mm -hmm. but it just keeps you in the game but the thing is that you add up the points at the end of the game and the fool's worth a lot of points so you want to keep them you know so, so that so it's important it's an important card in the game and so um Fast forward a little bit here, you know, the, the, these various, I mean, the, the, there are a number of different variations on, on the tarot trumps that have come out. Um, the, the, our idea that there were 22 and that they're, they're mystically um, attached to the Hebrew letters and the ancient Egypt seems to be pretty debunked at this point, um, although there's no reason not to apply those meanings to them if you want to. Um, from an esoteric well, I would think I would think here's what I would look at I, I think that the, you have to look at the actual imagery on the cards and relate to the imagery and the symbolism on the card and and if you and and just sticking Hebrew letters on them is sort of arbitrary and, and force fit it doesn't really fit the pictures and, and you know some people got very creative in trying to force fit it like life is Levy uh, but then the golden dawn system doesn't even use this system anyway because you know right. uh, they, they, they apply uh you know, you know, uh, 
look, look, look. A, a, a different, they apply a, different. a left a left to the fool and he applied it to the to the magician so their whole right. order is totally different and then and then he got really creative saying look at the position of the hands of the magician how it looks like the hebrew letter and like you know right. he, like he'd, he'd go way out and you know like projecting onto these things like somehow that they were the hebrew letters and yet and then the golden dawn said nah <laughs> well, yeah we're gonna go in a completely <laughs> different direction <laughs> yeah we're gonna do something else you know so uh well, and, and, you know, and other people have a different position they things. all end up different right you know right. so so yeah i mean you know the 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 meaning that you get out of it is is kind of based upon what your expectations are to a certain extent right so what what is the meaning that you get out of that you got out of the tarot early when you when you first were um exploring it? like what what did they mean to you Okay, what what they meant to me is um, they they tended to have a, a, a mystical message about enlightenment that is is told through the trumps. So so when you're going from the fool to the world, you're going from uh, the, an every everyday reality to more and more enlightened state. And to do that, you had to go through some very difficult uh, cards in the middle, right? Which is basically the hero's journey, you know, mm -hmm. like as Joseph Campbell explains it. So, uh, so I started, once I understood that, I started relating it to other stories. And then I, I had a revelation one day that it related to the, uh, the great work of alchemy, the, the magnum opus. And that's why I came up with the alchemical tarot, because I wanted to show how the cards could be, could be describing the alchemical, a great work. So I have a couple of nerdy questions about this um, <laughs> that, uh, that may be more of interest to me than anyone else. But um, in, in, in creating the alchemical tarot, um, you were, uh, did you, did you feel like it just sort of downloaded into you or were you studying wood blocks and going, Hmm, where, how can I apply this? You know, was it, it a more, it, it was a revelation. Yeah. And did, yeah, did you I, feel like I, it came sort of fully formed into your consciousness or was there a good yeah, deal? Yeah, it of did. Like, lots of times things like that would happen. Mm -hmm. Like, like the thing is, um, I was looking, well, remember I told you about that book, The Picture Museum of uh, Magic and Alchemy. And, yeah. You know, yeah, okay. So uh, it has this long title, I forgot it. But the thing is, you know, it had all these alchemical images. And then, and I, I was getting more and more obsessed with reading all about alchemy and mysticism, and, you know, ancient, ancient uh, uh, mystics and Gnostics. And, uh, and, and so I was sitting one day reading the book and I was looking at this uh, image of uh, the Philosopher's Stone. Now the Philosopher's Stone, is not a material thing. It's a stone. It's not the stone. Like so, you, how do you draw a picture of something that doesn't? You can't really see. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually, so usually, the alchemists would draw uh, an, a, a mandala-like form. And this particular mandala, it showed uh, there was a wreath, like a like a, a wreath, and then a heart in the center, and a, and a rose coming out. And it was in the center of a cross. And then in the four corners, uh, outlined by the cross, there was the symbols of the four elements. And um, and I was thinking about, okay, so obviously it's related to the, the sacred heart image in Christianity, but the thing is, right. I'm looking at it and I say, well, you know, the heart's a symbol of soul. And I was thinking about the world card and how the dancing woman on the world card is sort of like, uh, a, a, you know, like a soul, you know? And then, in fact, I was thinking of how she looks very much like an Egyptian hieroglyph um, for the, like one aspect of the soul. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, then, it's, and then I just thought, I said, well, if the, if the woman on the world card is the soul and the heart in, in on this image is the soul, and then, and then the four evangelists in the corners, uh, you know, in medieval uh, symbol, symbolism, they were related to the four elements and the four directions, the four seasons, you know, the, the, the fourfold world. Uh, so see, so the two symbols are interchangeable. So if the two symbols are interchangeable and then the world card is the final card of the trumps and and the and this and this mandala for the philosopher's stone is the final outcome of the great work maybe they're telling the same story and that was like boom you know like yeah. like, like i opened this portal in my mind and all these images came floating out and like i'm seeing you know alchemical images and tarot cards going together so i got out uh jung's uh, psychology and alchemy and i said and has it's filled with alchemical pictures and i'm writing names of tarot cards next to all the pictures you know, so this happened like in, in you know, minutes. Well, it's funny because a very similar thing happened with, with for me with the, the Greek magical papyri tarot. And I wasn't even sure that it was the magical papyri that I was going to be using at the time. It was it was just the, the ancient Greek gods. I was just like, you know, all of a sudden it just downloaded into me that this, this pottery art 
looked like tarot to me and I, you know, and, and I just, I, I again, I, yet, like you say, just all these different images came rolling through my mind. So great, wonderful that art inspiration works in similar ways for different people. <laughs> but I, I, mean, I think artists like, uh, see the thing is, if, you, if you're an artist, you have a, the power of, uh, to visualize. Mm -hmm. and, and and vision and being able to visualize is a magical uh, a practice. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, that's like like Jung talks about uh, you know uh, creative uh, you know imagination. Well, it's funny because you you um, w when we first started, it seemed like you were a little bit nervous that I was going to be poking too much into into magical uh, things that you know maybe aren't aren't as much of interest to you. But the, your whole story that you've told is very magical, and you know I think yeah, that, yeah, that was <laughs> the, was the things I was reading. Your thing was talking about a lot about rituals and like mm -hmm. you know things that I don't do too much. I mean, I did, I mean, I, you know, I I have uh, experimented with that where you know I, I went to some pagan groups and you know w Wiccan groups. We used to listen to Marion's Cauldron from uh, on the radio all the time. She you know she was a witch in New York, but the thing is that more and more I just went my own way. Sure. Well, and I think I think there's no real one definition of what a person's magical life is like. And, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, having involved yourself so deeply in tarot and, and hermetic philosophy and so forth, you, you would be burned as a, as a, you know, as a witch with the rest of us. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, you're, okay. definitely, you're definitely with us. No, I'm so included now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No escaping it. Um, so um, do, do you do tarot readings like for, for yourself or for other people? Just for friends? Yeah, I, yeah, I do. I, I haven't been doing as much. I used to do them a lot for people, but I haven't been doing it as much anymore because I it takes a lot of energy and, and I just prefer to yeah. do my own projects. I mean, but I, I, you know, I know what you but mean. I do readings all the time, you know, like just for all kinds of, you know, things about like, uh, is it okay to take this, the vitamins now or later or... <laughs> Are, now what you you've created uh, a number of decks, and I want to I want to kind of go through the, the decks you've created before we end this uh, talk. So I, so don't let me forget that. But um, which one do you tend to use when you're reaching for um, a tarot to do a reading? Um, well, I have the new edition Alchemical Tarot and the Sevenfold Mystery. Those are the ones that you go for. I'm on my desk here, ready to go. <laughs> Um, so what's the difference between the sevenfold mystery and the alchemical tarot? What is what is the what is the well, the, uh, well the sevenfold mystery? <sighs> I was looking at Burn, you know, remember I told you I like pre-Raphaelite art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Burn Jones was probably was my, you know my favorite pre-Raphaelite artist and probably the most famous. And so I'm looking at Burn Jones's paintings and reading about and studying, you know, about the pre-Raphaelites. And I realized, you know, I always loved Botticelli. And it was like, and I and I found out that it was the pre-Raphaelites that sort of saved Botticelli from obscurity, like you know. And now Botticelli is probably you know the Birth of Venus is like iconic. It's one of the most famous paintings in the world, right? But it wasn't like that in the early 1800s. Like people had forgotten about it. Interesting. And 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 like Botticelli and and I, you know was and Michelangelo were like um, they they're the epit you know they're both artists from the 1400s in Italy. And they're the epitome of this resurgence of uh, Neoplatonism. Like it's incorporated into their artwork, you know, because like, like Botticelli's Birth of Venus, like a lot of people don't realize what he did is he reclaimed the nude. And, like in, and then now the nude is like considered like normal, like, you know, for, for mm -hmm. art, like it's a standard image, the, the nude. Right? Less and less so. We're becoming more and more insane as a culture right now. I, I had I had my child bring an art book into school that had nude pictures and they they like took it upset. to the office and what yeah they got upset about it yeah yeah oh well that's interesting yeah no I I, I was shocked. Seemed... <laughs> okay yeah well well the thing is um it was interesting like in the Renaissance at first like nudes were starting to come back because people were, were interested in classical culture and of course classical mm -hmm. culture they, you know had nudes right so the news. thing is uh. The, the the but most of them, they they sort of accepted the male nudes quicker than the female nudes um and and the, and and the, in fact there was a story uh, um about how like like in this i, I guess it was a, a one of the neighboring cities of pisa uh they, they they had uncovered this beautiful marble venus and they set it up in the middle of town and then there was a famine and they got worried that they were being idolatrous and you know and uh, so, the, so they said, we've got to get rid of the Venus, you know, because God's mad at this. So they said, okay, let's bury it in Pisa and give them the bad luck. Because, <laughs> you know, good Christians that they were. 
Wow. So, <laughs> so the thing is, so it's this sort of love hate. So, like you know, there were news, but they show Adam and Eve, but they make them look ashamed of themselves, right? Sure, right. Okay. So, um, I mean, once in a while you start seeing uh, like a sort of classical nude, but then but Cheli comes along, and and uh, and 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 Ficino. Now, Ficino uh, was the preeminent Neoplatonist Hermeticist. Yes. In the Renaissance. Like he's the one who translated the Hermetic material in Plato and all these things into Latin so that people could read it in the West. Okay. And 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 he had this academy that like the Medici's, uh, you know, Cosimo de Medici set up this academy for him outside of town. He gave him a villa and he said, here, recreate Plato's academy. Right. So so when Botticelli got was commissioned to do the birth of Venus, he uh, and, and the primavera and these things, paintings like this, he would actually go get advice on the symbolism, you know, from the preeminent renaissance neoplatonist and 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 so so the see the thing is in so one of the things that uh pacino translated was the symposium by plato and then in the symposium uh there's this story like one of the stories in the symposium is about how there's two types of uh, of, of of venus that are aphrodite you know there's uh the aphrodite who uh is, is worldly you know, and then the one who's born from from the uh, the foam uh, of the wave, which is really because Uranus was castrated, you know, right. the whole thing, right? Okay, but the, but because he represents the heaven, so there's the, the worldly Venus and and then the uh, the celestial Venus, and 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 how it's the the worldly Venus is the one that rules over sex and procreation, where the celestial Venus is this ideal beauty and love. You know like that represents a, a longing for a higher state of consciousness and immortality right so so um so when he paints the primavera and he paints venus she's clothed but you see in the primavera we see like the like uh you know uh there's there's these symbolic sex scenes going on with like uh, uh clarice and 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 the and zephyr i think it's the wind you know and uh and and you know and uh we see Hermes is sort of poking up at the clouds, looking for you know this higher ideal, and like you know, the, and the three graces are there, and there's flowers blooming all over. So it's, it's sort of about this whole fertility of the land, right? Right, and how that's connected to sex. And but she's fully clothed, right? Okay, then he shows the birth of Venus being born from the waves on the shell, right? And she's nude, and she represents the highest ideal. So now he sanctified the nude, like everybody said. Oh yeah, so the nude's not. This isn't sex. It's, this is the highest ideal, right? And then you know you see like Titian like would he did this uh, uh, painting sacred and profane love and it shows a nude and a clothed woman right so people think okay the nude must be profane but no it's the opposite. He, you well, know. I, I, well, and that actually fits with biblical thinking as well because the Adam and Eve were naked and, and unashamed early and then when it was once they actually became profane that they clothed, that, themselves, that they right? clothed yeah. themselves. So yeah, okay. So the thing is. Uh, so that sets up now. Now all artists are like free to make nudes and make and reclaim right. this classical tradition, right? But it's funny because in the classical tradition, they in Greece they weren't so so in, uh, so ready to make female nudes in the first place. They made male nudes a lot, but they didn't make female right. nudes. When they made Venus, she was always clothed. But then there's this whole story about how Praxiteles, uh, he was commissioned um, to make to make this uh, Venus for for the uh, for this community, this beautiful statue of Venus, and he did one clothed and one nude. You know, it's, it's the famous pose where she looks like she's sort of like putting her hand in front of her breast slightly and in, in, in her groin. And uh, so they said, you know, they turned to turn down the nude, you know, like there's a way, why are we, this is too risque for us, right? So, but then I think it was Delos or I might have like said, no, no, we want that nude. Right? So they bought the nude, right? And they set up and it became this huge tourist attraction and it made them rich. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, an aside, that same uh, story plays out in pottery art as well. There's there's um, remarkably little female nudity, uh, you know, unless it's actually depicting something sexual. Women are always clothed and men are often naked. So um, yeah, yeah, well, because they the athletes used to perform naked. Right. Right. See, and, and so the only so the, like in Sparta, the women do athletics and perform naked also, but like the rest of the Greeks forget it. You know, they had to stay home. So uh, you know, so so it sort of encumbered female culture a lot but now now it's in that we come into to the later hellenistic period like they start seeing all these female nudes and of course everybody started making nude venuses and that's the stuff they started digging up and that's what influenced the romans and right you know and influenced the renaissance so that's why it became a tradition and that's why we see it in the tarot right so the, so you see how like the, the tarot, you know why is the why is the nude figure on the world card that's the highest spiritual truth see it's like botticelli's nude yeah i mean it, uh 
the, 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 you know, and, and again, that is sort of biblical since man is created in the image of God, right? So our, our naked body is yeah, it's the naked, it's like naked truth, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, but the, but the question you originally asked me is why I did the, the sevenfold mystery? Yeah. <laughs> well, that seems a long time ago. Um. <laughs> so the thing was, because it was because like the pre raphaelites they they you know, Burn Jones and and uh, William Morris and 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 the and Ruskin, the the critic, they all went on the grand tour to Italy, and like you know, uh, Burn Jones would lay on the floor. He put a, he put a carpet on the floor in the Sistine Chapel, and he would lay there all day looking at the ceiling and making sketches and stuff. You know, and, he, and then they rediscovered Botticelli and made it say, look at this, look at Botticelli. This is what we're after. This is the thing before Raphael that's so pure and beautiful. And, you know, so, uh, you know, so basically, and, and Michelangelo is the same thing. Like, like if you look at the Sistine Chapel and you look at his Christ figure on the, on the wall, you know, behind the altar, it looks like Apollo, you know, it's like a male nude with like gold hair and he doesn't have a beard. You know, he's like, you know, he's muscular and like, right. it's, he's making an Apollo and saying it's Christ. So, so the same thing. So between the male nudes of Michelangelo and then the female nudes of Botticelli, and it's like, okay, so that they were picking up this Neoplatonic uh, uh, symbolism, and then and then was and and so he's really enamored by the 1400s in, in Italy, and that's when the Tarot was developed, and that's and Tarot incorporated all these Neoplatonic ideas, Hermeticism and Neoplatonism. Which to go back to your original question, that, that Hermeticism does come from Alexandria, which is Egypt. Right. Okay, but it isn't like okay, the not cards a, came. From Egypt, right, it's not a direct but, line of transmission. It's more of a re reawakening, rather. Yeah, there's this reawakening of, of Hellenistic and Neoplatonic uh, culture, and see Neoplatonism. Even you know, Plotinus, the first Neoplatonist, was from Alexandria, also. You know, so the thing is, it's that that Hellenistic Egyptian culture is being revived in Re Renaissance Italy, and that's being uh, incorporated in the Tarot. So the throw is Italian, but the, it's about a rebirth of classical culture, which is connected to Egypt. Yeah. And so anyway, so that's what I saw. So I saw that in 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 I mean in, in uh, Burn Jones, and uh, so I, so I'm looking at at, the, at the, his images, and he has this one of temperance, and it goes, "Well, that's like a tarot card." Then he had this other one, like it was foolishness. And I said, "Well, that could be the fool, right?" Sure. And then. And then there was a Wheel of Fortune card, and you know, like, like he had all these images. Like, well, those are the Trumps and the Tarot he's doing, you know. Only he doesn't know he's doing it because they're just they're just typical Renaissance themes. Because the sure. Tarot themes are all typical of Renaissance culture; they're not just from the Tarot. Okay, so I'm saying, well, he's doing a Tarot deck, and he doesn't know it. I want to finish it for him. So I made my own drawing of the uh, of of the. Um, you know, the temperance, like that's the first card I did. I just made my own version of his temperance painting, you know, just totally based on his painting. And then I said, okay, but he didn't do them all. So I'm going to start doing the other cards based on his style and just kept going, you know, and they had this drawing of, he never did the painting, he just did this drawing of this woman as foolishness. And I sort of based my drawing on that drawing. And, and it was, it's a little sketchy. He didn't even have his typical, like the, the figure's a little too short for his, like his, his figures are long, you know, they're usually like nine or eight heads tall. And this was a little like shorter and I had to stretch it out and, you know, create more of his finished, you know, Burne Jones style. And then I started looking at other, you know, other images and pick up something here or there and then and just create other ones that are in the same style. And so I finished the tarot and I said, well, now this should be a bridge between the 1800s and the 1400s, because that's what he is. Mm -hmm. And and so it should so it should incorporate because you know basically the, the pre raphaelites were setting the stage for the golden dawn, they were cre creating this romantic uh, culture like this this uh, this idea like the romantics in general were uh, reacting against the age of enlightenment which is the age of logic and science and like they were trying to say, hey when are you losing the magic. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were trying to reclaim the magic. In fact, a lot of like it, 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 romanticism started like in Germany and France, places like that, Belgium, uh, Holland, you know, uh, Switzerland. And and the thing is, but the romantics were heavily influenced at first by like the uh, by Rosicrucians and uh, by a, a German alchemists like uh, Bohm and, and Michael Meyer and you know mm -hmm. who did Atalanta Fugians. And which, uh, you know, so, so this type, of, like, and if you look at Atalanta Fugians in itself, like, see, these people were alchemists, but they weren't laboratory alchemists, because after Paracelsus, alchemy split, it split into lab alchemists, and then philosophical alchemists. And that's how we, we got Rosicrucians and, and all these philosophical texts like Atalanta Fugians. So, um, 
if you look at Atalanta Fugians, it's really a multimedia work of art, which, you know, you, as a multimedia work, uh, art, artist working in that yourself, you probably appreciate that because he wrote, he, he had these engravings made, he has poems with it, he has songs with it, he has music that he wrote, which are fugues. And see, so the very title, Atalanta Fleeing, Fugian, is a, is a, a pun on fugues. You're saying there's accompanying music that you're supposed to be listening yeah, to? Yeah, there's music. Yeah, the book has music. In fact, I, there, there's, I think people have, have, you know, made a recording of the, of the, mm. of, of the music from the book. Um, I only heard parts of it, though. But the thing is, uh, so, so this influenced the arts. So the Romantic artists were very influenced by alchemists. And and because that's just part of what they're and they're also influenced influenced by folklore and like they they look you know I love those stories about the about vampires and werewolves sure. and all this stuff you know because it was they're trying to reclaim that past that that uh, stuff and see and that's what the pre Raphaelites come out of the Romantic movement because they're trying to re, that's why they're going before Raphael they're trying to get back to that uh, you know that magic that's in you know they feel that art's a work of magic so that so they want to go back to that magic before Raphael when things were like uh like there's some spiritual and strong spiritual intent that's obvious in the work mm. yet they yet they wanted to have it they yet with that they were applying a new sense of realism and observation that made the fantasy seem hyper real oh well, yeah like they were taking place in reality Photograph. Also, also, they were the first. They would they would paint outside in the sunlight, like plein air. You know, like like about ten years before any impressionist did. Mm -hmm. So they sort of invented that whole thing. The perception of light as a as a yeah, way of and, and, and when I, I mean I saw a show I saw a show strangely enough I saw this really great show of pre Raphaelites when I was in Atlanta that was on loan, at the, at the Atlanta Muse Art Museum, and and I, and there was a huge show uh, from I think it was from. Uh, Birmingham in England, where they have a lot of pre raphaelites and uh, they would they would use a white canvas and they would put dabs of pure color on, and then have the color like the color would mix itself just like the what the impressionists were doing. Only they create super realistic effects, and then they you know the figures would have like very sharp realistic details, but the backgrounds, the landscapes, the foliage. Like when you look at it close, you look up close and it's just like, what's well, all just stabs of color? And then you would step back and like, Phew. it's just like this reality came, like, like it's like a magic act. Like you, like you couldn't believe the realities and you can't, you cannot appreciate these paintings in prints. Like if you look in a book, you don't know what you, you don't know what they're doing. Hmm. It's like, you know, obviously with some of the subjects people appreciate because they say, wow, look how beautiful. But the thing is when you see the paintings in person, this other thing goes on, like, you know, like, like uh, there was this huge painting that was like this, uh, just a woman outside with some sheep and children, you know, that was actually paint, painted outside in the sun. And I could feel the heat. I mean, you know, I mean, it was like, you're there. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, it, amazing that, I mean, uh, this, this brings back the idea of the, the, you know, the illustrated books that, that were being created in the, you know, before, before printing. So much effort goes into that kind of um, artistic endeavor that you and I have such huge advantages on because we can just sort of scan things into a computer and yeah, then right. <laughs> start messing around with it. And, uh, even that, it takes, me, it takes me days and days to do something, even with all that. Sure, no, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. Um, so uh, anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about your about so the sevenfold mystery was inspired by sort of pre-raphaelite art and the, and the fact that you were seeing a lot of mystical stuff in there that that you wanted to um bring into a tarot deck um and, and it's but it seems to have sort of like a it's like a cousin of the the alchemical tarot revealed in some ways well it, it the thing is um the uh, the generally for the minor suits in my decks I, I followed what I decided for the alchemical tarot. So yeah. like, yeah, and, and I was facing it. I was saying like, like, what what is the criteria for the symbolism on the card? So we have the four suits, and they relate to the four elements, and then those relate to personality types, like the the four humors. But then Jung, you know, like again, you know, I was more influenced by Jung. And Jung found that the humors weren't accurate uh, as far as his observation of personality types. So he came up with the four functions of consciousness. Mm -hmm. so I usually follow his idea. Of the four functions and then and then okay so that's the four suits so okay and then we have the numbers one to ten which each have symbolism especially in alchemy and then and so if you applied the number symbolism to that suit symbol then what do you come up with 
you know, and then, and I look at what uh, Pamela Cohen Smith came up with and like, you know, sometimes it made sense, sometimes it didn't. Sure. So, so I try to give her the benefit of the doubt, especially if she had a historic precedence, like the, the three of swords. I don't think I would put three swords in the heart for the three of swords, but she did that based on the solo Busca deck, which goes back to the 1400s. Right. Such a powerful symbol. I said, okay, I'm, this has a real precedent. I'm going to go with it, you know, and I, and I can sort of, you know vaguely see how it makes sense you know because swords represent the thinking function and three is is uh like like a sort of completion like like uh, uh you know it's, it's going past the two into like a, a a third choice or like a completion like an individual and i said so i guess that could represent sorrow you know if, if they're negative thoughts you know <laughs> so well then yeah i mean you also have you can throw saturn in there with with three and that brings you know the saturn sort of a heavy sorrowful uh planet sometimes too so. yeah I, I i don't use much astrology so no no i've actually been using a like a, a pretty new approach to to for me to to what the the i've been i've been kind of doing an interesting dance with my with mine because i've been trying to like com not get too far away from traditional interpretations of the tarot because I don't want to have people suddenly have to go this doesn't look I, I can't work with this it's not you know but at the same time I'm trying to do something different so it, it, it's been an interesting experience creatively with the well, minor well, cards which I think end up being more work right because the the majors that all just sort of they're all these archetypes you just go boom 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 they all pop into your head yeah yeah uh, and suddenly you're you're dealing a little bit more with the mud of life with the <laughs> with the minor cards um but yeah <laughs> So anyway, um, let's let's go through let's go through your deck. So the first one you created was the alchemical um, tarot revealed. No, I'm mean, sorry. The, 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 alchemical what? tarot. The alchemical tarot. Tarot. Yeah. And then, then what was the next one? Well, well, see, the, the thing is, um, the, the alchemical tarot renewed is when I took it over. Oh, when you when you took when you when you republished yeah, okay. it. Okay. So. The thing, but that what happened? See, basically, what happened is, uh, you know. The alchemical tarot, um, I mean, that was a whole bunch of synchronicities and magical things happened for the alchemical tarot to get published too. But the th thing is, I basically teamed up with Rosemary Ellen Guiley who wrote, worked with me on the book. Mm -hmm. So people would think, okay, he designed the deck, she, she wrote the book, or worse, they would think, oh, she wrote the book and told him what to draw on the deck. <laughs> like Pam, you're, you're, his, you're her Pamela Coleman Smith? Yeah, right. Because people have this prejudice, like you know, writers smart, the artists just dumb hands. Right. You know? right. Okay. So, uh, okay. The thing was, I created the deck and designed the deck, and drew, did all the artwork, and then I also wrote the book. But I never wrote a book before, and like teaming up with her, she helped me frame the book and like you know make it like you know, so the publishers would want. And so that's how we got a you know uh, Harper Collins, which is one of the biggest publishers in the world, because they trusted me because I was with her. Right. But of course, because she already had a reputation, they put her name first on the box, you know, because, you know, they thought that was a selling point. Sure. Okay. So um, then they, the, her, that was in, that was through the London branch in Thorson's. And then uh, Harper Collins San Francisco decided they wanted an angel to row. And they asked us to come up with a proposal for an angel to row. So um, now I don't know if you remember, but this is, they, they both came out in 1995. And at that time, angels were everything, you know, like, they, like, you know, if you went in the mall and there were angels selling shoes, you know, they were, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, they, they had, I mean, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, you know, the cartoon strip. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, like you said, yeah, and he had some cartoon strips, that, you know, I believe in angels and Tiger and Whites because they're everywhere. Look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you should have angels in it, you know. It was like, <laughs> okay, so they obviously want an angels to row. So we put together a proposal for an angels to row, and then the thing was, um, I didn't realize that they had asked they asked like about ten people to put together a proposal. There was like a, mm. they were giving us a contest, basically. <laughs> I wouldn't even have done it if I known it was a contest. Sure. So the thing is, but then they said, "Oh no, we want you to do it." Okay, so we did the angels to row, and and it was like, oh, it was horrible. I had hardly any time to do it. You know, I mean, the whole thing had to get done in six months. That's yeah, tight. Yeah, so the th so um, I wasn't real happy with it, but it was, but it, it turned out to be the only de deck at that time that I that kept bringing in royalties. <laughs> so it was damn. it was more yeah. popular than the alchemical tarot, you're saying? Yeah, I, well, I don't think it was necessarily more popular, but it's just that the publisher kept it going and kept bringing in royalties past the mm -hmm. advance. 
Okay, and also they sold the rights to the, like Germans and you know uh, other people, and then you get money from that. You know, so it's like because Angel because we tapped in, tapped into something that was really popular. Okay, so then now this is like you know this is supposed like when I when I got the contract to do the alchemical tarot, it was like uh, it, it just all came together. Like it was it was you know the thing was you know like i never wrote a book before or anything i was just i was an artist right and also i'm writing this book for this major publishing company and like you know like my friend scott who wanted to get published was like you know i was like what you're getting published by harvard collins like you never wrote anything you know and it was it was weird like and then it just all sort of came together and also like they gave me a year to do the alchemical tarot and it took two years but they kept saying okay we'll extend the date you know which was like nuts because publishers don't do that so the deck wanted to be published you know right okay so so then um about it was like I that was 95 it took maybe like five years I would put out proposals and everybody you know, nothing was happening like because like what happened is the the uh publishers had like they published so many decks and it was almost like if it had bad artwork in it they thought it was more mystical or something so <laughs> but that didn't work out and well in the long run because people right. didn't really like them because right. they had bad artwork so the thing uh, so there were a lot of decks that publishing got forgotten about because they really just ended up on the remainder shelf. And um, the, uh, you know, so, so, and then also the printing cost for color went up. So a lot of publishers didn't want to deal with that. So it wasn't until I was like years later, um, I, I, I got a, like I was, I was at this uh, Tarot convention in Chicago and, and I met the people from, uh, uh, you, you know, I met the, the Wellen and, and uh, U.S. Games, and they were so they were do, doing decks. And then, uh, you, like Wellen said that they were interested in, in doing a Saints tarot. And I said, well, you know, I had an idea, you know, based on the Saint cards. And in fact, you know, if that fact in the Renaissance when they were making the tarot cards, the other thing the printers were doing were making those Saint cards. They were making them at the same time, you know. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the Saints, you know, there's all kinds of symbolism. So I put together the tarot of the Saints and wrote a book to go with it. And, and, the and was that a twenty? Was that a twenty-two card deck or was it a seventy-eight card deck? Seventy-eight. And and so, what did you do with the minors on that? Did you stick with your your? Well, previous... I, I I I see. I kept like for my minor suits. I always, if it's my deck, I follow suit with um, uh, what I came up with for the alchemical tarot. That became my pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the thing is, uh, but on on the angels one, I didn't have time to really develop. So I just. What I, for the angels tarot, I just had these different angels that looks almost like the French playing card suit symbols, and and uh, you know, and I would just have a repetition of the of the of the of the oh, okay. angel, and yeah. I didn't really have any other uh, allegorical images. But now for the uh, tarot of the saints, I had allegorical images, but I'd have go back more to like like the Minchiati, like what I was showing you, where you'd have the suit symbol repeated, and then have a small image central, on the bottom the central motif central or on the bottom yeah that would have the meaning right instead of incorporating them like the way Pamela Coleman smith did okay so um and i thought that seemed to make a bridge between the traditional decks and 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 this idea that, like uh, having having allegorical figures on the pips so we did that and then also at that same time llewellyn said that they wanted to do stuff about buddhism and i said well i had this idea for a buddha tarot so then so then i got the contract with the buddha tarot Okay, so then, then Llewellyn, uh, they basically, um, they had given me a pretty good advance. I talked them into giving me an advance that seemed sizable, and then they were pissed at me because the, the, uh, uh, the royalties never made it up to the advance. <laughs> so it's not like I cheated them or something, you know. So. <laughs> so they didn't, so, they, so then to do anything else with them, they said any other, uh, royalties I get from them would go against the advance from the you know the first two decks I did with them, and and I said well that, that's not so I don't want to do anything with you so that's it you know okay so um then I so at that time I started working on my own deck the Tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery and I didn't know what I was going to do with it so I just slowly worked on it then I got a contract I got really enamored with the whole idea of uh, uh, vampires and I and I uh, got and I had an agent who. Uh, like got me you know uh, a deal with uh um uh, saint martin's press and and then uh and so we, i did the vampire tarot and vampire and you remember vampires are really big again so sure. it started being like angels but by the time it took so long to get the vampire tarot out by the time it came out they were everybody was into sparkling vampires you know like for oh, right, the... 
<laughs> and mine was based on Dracula, so it wasn't. So it didn't really sell as well as it seemed like you it should. You didn't hit the what what the current aesthetic was for for vampires, but yeah. So that so that, that was a, so it was a little disappointing. But I really liked that deck. In fact, people keep asking me to reprint it. So in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, Penguin got in touch with me. Uh, the, the, the Mitch Horowitz, who was an editor at uh, Torture Penguin. The division of penguin he came, he came to, i was doing lectures at the new york open center and he came to my lecture i was really impressed with my knowledge of the tarot so he wanted me to write a book on tarot separate from uh the from the decks and so so that came, was uh the tarot history symbolism and divination which when it, it came out um you know they, they send you know uh pre-released the, the book to get reviews and it got a review in in uh, a book list which is the magazine of the american library association mm -hmm. and and it's about i think it was only the fourth tarot book ever to get reviewed in, in the magazine and they gave it a starred review and they said this may be the best book ever written on the tarot Whoa. so that was pretty big and yeah. you know when I, I called mitch you know when he sent me the review and i called mitch i said like this is what they said and he said wow it's really good and then he called me back later and said, that's really what was i thinking of? that's really good you know <laughs> said, like we're gonna, we're gonna put you know he said like in the first the first printing of the deck had sold out in a month i mean of the book so 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 they did a second printing of the book and that sold out in two months and on second printing they put the review right on the cover mm -hmm. and then you know and it's still in print so i still get royalties from that <laughs> And that's been in print. I don't know. That was I don't know when was that. It was like it's it's been you know over I don't know. Let's see, probably like fifteen years or something. So uh, so in the meantime, then I I, I was um, you know the alchemical tarot. I was seeing how it was um, it was like the, like every like the thing was what happened with the alchemical tarot is that uh, Thorson's in London in London split with uh, Harper Collins in in San Francisco. And they so weren't distributing in the United States through Harper Collins anymore. They mm. had this other distributor, so no, it was being really badly distributed. So nobody even knew it existed. So then people started thinking it was out of print, and then the price of the first edition, re, you know, reselling went up and up and up. And it finally did go out of print. And and so I saw on eBay like one of the first editions of the Alchemical Tarot sold for two thousand seventy dollars. Wow. This is like a thirty five dollar set, and it sold for this much money. And I said, well, gee, I you know, I could. I could make uh, sheet clay prints and hand cut them and everything and sell them for like a few hundred dollars and it'd be cheaper than that. And they got this art piece and I could sign it and everything. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. And then, then I said, well, you know, maybe I, I, a friend of mine said, well, why don't we just print it, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> so I got the rights back from Harper Collins because it, it went out of print. And then, right. and then I, uh, I uh, so then I, I said I'll do my own edition and that's called renewed because the, the first edition see I had designed the cards to look like I wanted them to be the size of the Wade Smith cards mm -hmm. and so I drew the whole deck like that and then and then Harper Cullen said oh no but we have this die already made that's this other proportions <laughs> and it's wider than what you drew and that's oh this, you know, I mean, for two years I've been drawing the pictures and now you tell me right. so you know <laughs> Okay, so, so, I, so I designed this border with like columns around it, you know, like mm -hmm. a doorway or something uh, and made the picture smaller, right? So I wasn't real happy with that, but that solved the problem. Okay, so when I got it back then, I got rid of the border and I made the picture the right before. So you're saying the one that sold for $2,000 is an inferior version of the one. Oh, yeah, of course. The first edition is inferior. The book's not even, you know, like you know, I wrote it with Rosemary and it's like concise and hardly anything there. And, mm -hmm. and that's even, some, you know, things that later I realized were historically inaccurate that because I found out more stuff. And, sure. you know, obviously, obviously, like the best edition is always the most current edition because that's the one you're most up to date and really been working on of course and then as i keep doing editions i keep improving it so now i'm up to the sixth edition of the of the alchemical tarot renewed which is but this, that includes the first you know even though the first one isn't renewed it's like i include that as the first right, right. but the renewed is second edition and so so i'm up to the this uh, you know the, the sixth edition which isn't printed yet so i'm i i and what's in print right now is the fifth edition i've already designed the sixth edition but it, uh, you know i'm you know just fine-tuning before i print it so the the art has changed or just the the, the back of the, the art, art changed the coloring changed but the art i also and you know you look at your drawings and you say oh gee I, that look that's like a proportion i should fix that you know or like oh this symbolism isn't right i should add this to it or interesting so, you, so every edition has has changes in it 
Yeah, they all have to. And I added uh, chemical symbols to it to make it more exciting. I, I think I have the second edition um, from many years back, but it might it might be further along than that. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, uh, so at what point did you start on this opus here, this gigantic book? That, well, uh, what happened? Well, I talked to Mitch and I said, you know, I, I really want to update my book. And he said, well, you know, it's, it, I don't think we're ready to update yet. And he put, put me off, even though he said, told me that. Mitch said that the, the Thoreau uh, history symbolism divination is the best thing he published, which he thought that was saying something because he published a lot of good stuff, you know. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so I said, well, I, you know, and I'm learning more and more and more about Thoreau and, and, and other things that I want to put in there. And see, also, with, like when I did the, when I was doing the book with Mitch, I was writing the book and it's getting longer and longer and longer. And he's saying, look, we want to sell this book at a certain cost and you're getting it too big. And, and we've got to keep it. <laughs> I've had that you know, conversation, have, yeah. You know, have these practical com you know, conversations about like economics, right? It's going to cost more. And we have to sell for more. Mm -hmm. And then I'm writing and he's looking at what I got. And he goes, well, it's all, I don't know how we're going to cut this down. So he, so he went to the, the main, you know, the, whoever's in charge of the whole penguin. He said, look, I want to extend this book because, you know, we can't fit that price range. You know, we make it, you know, it would make this book like seventeen dollars or something, and 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 they said, oh yeah, look, it was good material you have. Like this is revolutionary. So, uh, I mean, I even things like when I wrote the book, like even things like uh, when I was championing Pamela Cullen Smith as the designer of the Wade Smith, it was like controversial. You know, like mm -hmm. what? Didn't Wade design it? <laughs> Which is like crazy because he never designed anything in his life. Right. So. Uh, you know, like the people will be looking at, like they'd be looking at the at the tarot cards, and they say, "Look at this little detail. What did Wait mean by this?" You know, like as if he, he didn't even know it was there. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, I sort of set them straight, and then and and got real history in there, and like and 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 even when I did the alchemical tarot originally, people, a lot of people were upset with me. I mean, I seem to I seem to upset people at first, and then they, and then they sort of get, and I get more and more people on board, and then they go, "Wow, this is really great," you know, because because <laughs> basically, like, you see, the, when the American Library Association appreciates what you're doing, and it's like, oh, now you got some official approval, you right? Know? <laughs> yeah. So so it's, so, what, so like you know what you're doing. I mean. So what um what which ones of all these decks that you've created are currently available in the marketplace right now? Um, there's a there's a fifth edition of the um, alchemical tarot. Yeah, the, the alchemical tarot fifth edition. Uh, alchemical tarot Renew renewed fifth edition, fifth edition. The uh, tarot of the sevenfold mystery. Uh, the Marziano tarot, which is my recreation of the earliest deck described by Marziano with the, uh, with the bird suits. With the bird suit symbols. And um, what, what else do I have? Uh, Oh, I, ha I have the uh, the alchemical tarot of Marseille, which is my reinterpretation of the Marseille deck, as you know, with alchemical symbolism. Cool. Um, and I have the, uh, the the tarot of the al alchemical magnum opus, which is a sort of a uh, distillation of the alchemical tarot down to like simplified artwork and like down to the essence of the symbols. Mm. And um, sorry, I have to think. Okay, also. I have, uh, you know, I, like I, I like I lecture regularly. I was lecturing regularly at the Metropolitan Museum before the pandemic, and uh, I, on their collection, and and they have some of the oldest printed, you know, woodcut printed decks in the world. There, mm -hmm. these ones from Ferrara. So I recreated the, the Ferrara deck by hand, you know, like where I would do sheet clay prints and hand cut them. So that's an art edition. See, the, you know, and, and they have a copy of that in the museum, also in the in the library with the with the originals. And and um, let's see, what else did I do in Tarot? I'm trying to think about all the Tarot stuff. Then I, I, well, I did the um, the Raziel Tarot with Rachel, you know, Rachel Pollock, which is based on Jewish themes. But with, that was only a, a, a special edition of uh, the you know, 22 trumps and the and, and with the, the Tree of Knowledge and the Tree of Life card after. And th so that's not in print anymore? Yeah, well, we sold it, you know, we did a limited edition and sold it all, you know. So, I mean, and f the, uh, I forgot, you know, we kept thinking, we keep thinking we're going to make a full deck, but it's like, it's, uh, I don't know, because the thing is, uh, like Rachel saying, well, why don't we just base it on the Wade Smith Tarot? And I'm thinking, well, I never based it anything on the Wade Smith Tarot. And then <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So if, <laughs> so it's like hard for us to get it together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna wrap things up so that you can get back to your life. But I, I want to ask you just one more question, and that is, um, 
if you could give some advice, a piece of advice to a young person who is um, trying to design a tarot deck or trying to, um, you know, get started in in creating magical art, what what would that be? Um, um, well, I would think just, you know, it's like making any art. The, the basically the tarot is a work of art, and it's and it's and it's made. I mean, artists have been copying and making, you know, their own versions of the tarot deck for like, you know, 500 years. So, uh, you know, just join in, start doing it, and <laughs> and then you see where it goes. And you let it evolve and see where it goes. Don't, you know, don't start off with some grandiose idea that you're going to be published and become famous right away. You like to work on it, you know, develop it. Fantastic. All right. Well, also, also, people are always asking me about self-publishing because I have my own publishing company now, Hermes Publications. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, um, I would say if you're starting out, it's better to start out with a publisher because they'll, you know, because you need an audience. <laughs> so unless you've been developing an audience for years on, you know, on, on the Internet and like you already have an audience, uh, it's better to have a publisher because they'll advertise you and like put you out there and like publicize what you're doing. So you'll get an audience. And then once you have an audience, then you could self-publish.